Hello, and welcome to Aviation Deep Dive. The Blumenthwas BV-155 was an experimental late-war German interceptor designed principally to counter the threat of the US AAF B-29 raids over Germany. Sporting an extreme design in order to come to terms with extreme design requirements, the 20 meter wingspan would serve to give better high altitude performance, whilst the driven turbocharger would keep the Daimler Benz DB603 running at 1400 horsepower up to an astonishing 15 kilometers of altitude. To understand the circumstances of this aircraft and what led to the design criteria that produced such an odd and unique layout, we have to head back to 1942. Although the BV-155 would ultimately end up being a reactionary aircraft to the alarming B-29, which is pretty much what the Ki-87 was, uh, the aircraft we covered in the last episode, its roots are actually quite substantially different. In the spring of 1942, Work on the prospective German aircraft carrier Graf Spee was well underway, and so the RLM began looking at specifications for aircraft that would be capable of carrier operations. With a navalized Stuka on the cards, the logical need for a carrier-based fighter led to talks with numerous German aviation companies about a suitable aircraft for the job. Messerschmitt, the golden child of the Luftwaffe with their 109, was only too keen to propose the ME-155. For all intents and purposes, the ME-155 was essentially to be a significantly modified 109G, a replacement for the previously attempted 109T. It would use as many parts as possible in common with the standard 109 in the interest of streamlining the transition to mass production, and would essentially keep the fuselage with entirely new wings. The infamous landing gear, too, would be altered to an inwardly retracting design, which would of course be much safer for carrier landings, which are pretty difficult to begin with, let alone trying to do it with narrow track undercarriage. The design was looking quite promising. To be powered by a 1500 horsepower DB605, and with a proposed armament of three MG151s and two MG131s. But ultimately, as the Graf Spee project ground to a halt in late 1942, after an order from Hitler that all of the large Kriegsmarine vessels should be scrapped, the usefulness of the ME-155 project essentially became zero overnight. The entire design process had been completed in September of 1942, almost exactly after which Messerschmitt were informed that the design would no longer be of any use and they should shelve the design for the foreseeable future. Messerschmitt was understandably pretty annoyed that they just essentially put all of the design work into an aircraft for it to be shelved immediately after completion, so it was decided to try and repurpose the design to a different RLM specification for a high-speed tactical bomber. Working quite quickly, all the naval equipment was to be removed, the central fuselage section strengthened, and the tail wheel elongated to give enough ground clearance for the 109 to take off with a 1000 kg bomb installed on its bomb rack. Designated the ME-155A, although a pretty intriguing design, the RLM was apparently having none of it and it was rejected almost immediately after it was proposed, leaving Messerschmitt disgruntled with a useless design at the end of 1942. However, scarcely a month later, the RLM once again reached out to Messerschmitt with a new, more important proposal. The end of 1942 did not just mark the end of the Graf Spee, it was also when the Boeing B-29 took to the skies for the first time, and news of this technologically advanced, high-speed, high-altitude bomber didn't take long to send shockwaves throughout the Luftwaffe's chain of command. The RLM needed a counter, and quick. It was unknown exactly how long it would take for the B-29 to hit operational squadrons in Europe, but it already had a pretty significant time advantage over whatever counter the Luftwaffe would be able to muster. Of course, what the Germans didn't know is that the B-29 was envisaged far more as a bomber for the Pacific theatre than for the European theatre. But nevertheless, Messerschmitt was given the requirement to urgently develop a high-altitude bomber interceptor capable of speeds and altitudes far exceeding what their current fighters were operating in, with heavy armament to match. 
Once again, the engineers at Messerschmitt went to the drawing board. As it was an urgent task, there wasn't a realistic chance of coming up with a design from scratch in the expected time frame. So they once again turned to the ME-155 idea and began modifications, which at this point was still essentially just a modified BF-109G. The wingspan was increased significantly to 13 meters, a pressurized cabin installed, and an elongated engine nacelle to fit the DB628 engine. The DB628 essentially being a 605, but with a two stage supercharger and an intercooler. In early 1943, a 109G was modified to the new spec, designated ME 155B, and underwent its maiden flight. In testing, the aircraft reached a maximum altitude of 15,500 meters and was all around promising but the RLM realized that the DB628 was not ready for production. Only about 50 had been built. They considered that it would move along the project considerably to fit an engine already in mass production and just add on a turbo supercharger instead. As such, it was ordered to Messerschmitt to abandon the DB628 and refit the ME155B with a DB603 paired with a TKL15 turbo supercharger. Accordingly, the frontal fuselage was further elongated, and work continued on modifications until August 1943, when the technical department of the RLM decided that Messerschmitt was too busy with developing the 109 and its planned successor. They didn't want to overload Messerschmitt and compromise on fighter production. As such, the project was forcefully removed from Messerschmitt's hands and put at the doormat of Blum und Voss, who were considerably less busy. However, after a preliminary analysis of the aircraft, Richard Vogt, chief of design at Blumenvoss, concluded that the ME-155B was a fairly weak design and it would be preferable to start from scratch. The RLM was against this, of course, as it would significantly delay the project, and so set up a shaky agreement between Messerschmitt and Blumenvoss that every major design change suggested by Vogt would have to be sanctioned by Messerschmitt. This deal fell through almost immediately, as the relations between the two companies plummeted as Blumenvoss wanted enormous changes to the design, whilst Messerschmitt was extremely unhappy with the proposed alterations. Ultimately, Richard Vogt gave up on Messerschmitt and wrote directly to the RLM, saying in a letter, Nach sorgfältiger Prüfung des Projekts Messerschmitt Me 155B1 kommen wir zum Schluss, dass die Zelle und Systeme in weiten Teilen komplett geändert werden müssen. Das beinhaltet erstens die zentrale Rumpfsektion, zweitens die Anordnung der Treibstofftanks, drittens die Anordnung und Mechanik des Fahrwerks, viertens den Ort für Kühlmittel und Ölkühler, fünftens das Tragflächenprofil, sechstens den Einbau eines Kompressors und siebtens den Entwurf des Höhenleitwerks. This came to a head after a series of hostile meetings between the lead designers at Messerschmitt and Blum und Voss, whilst officials from the technical department tried to act as intermediaries and calm the situation. Ultimately, they went nowhere, and the RLM ruled in favor of Blum und Voss, and gave them full control of the development and design of the aircraft from that point forward. As such, until the end of 1943, Blum und Voss committed themselves to a fairly thorough redesign of the aircraft, which eventually ended up as the renamed BV-155 V1, a pretty significant departure from the ME-155. The new design featured landing gear based off a JU-87, an all-new fuselage, a completely redesigned laminar flow wing, as well as a hefty internal fuel capacity of 1800 liters, or 475 gallons and the very distinctive underwing radiators. However, it had been over a year since the catalyst for such an interceptor had taken to the skies, and the construction on this aircraft hadn't even begun yet. Over the course of 1944 assembly began, but the consistent Allied bombing caused significant difficulties to Blumenvoss, who found themselves constantly having suppliers drop out of the equation and batches be cancelled. As such, it would be a painful nine months until the laborious construction of V1 was finally completed. Of course, by now it was September 1944, the war was essentially over, 
and the Luftwaffe had needed a high altitude interceptor in huge numbers piloted by skilled crew members many, many months before. Nevertheless, the newly finished 155 V1 was still a fascinating piece of technology, taking to the skies on the 1st of September 1944. Powered by a DB603A engine, the turbocharger would keep power up to an astonishing 1,450 horsepower at an altitude of 15,000 meters, or about 50,000 feet. The aircraft was also fitted with an MW50 boost system, allowing temporary periods of higher manifold pressure and significantly higher power by spraying a mix of water and methanol into the supercharger. However, it was not all smooth sailing. Some significant shortcomings involved the radiators not offering sufficient cooling at takeoff or at high angles of attack, which resulted in the DB603 overheating badly at certain critical stages of flight, such as takeoff and landing. Incorporating larger radiators, as well as some other minor alterations to the canopy and tail, the V2 was finished in early 1945 which should have been considered a prototype for the production run. However, the engineers at Blumenvoss were not particularly happy with how the aircraft had turned out. And even before the V2 had taken its maiden flight, they proposed a revised version to the technical department, which would be powered by a DB603U, with a supercharger and a different gear ratio for the four-bladed wooden propeller. A number of armament setups were considered, all of them fairly heavy to deal with the huge American bombers, consisting of a mix and match of three 30mm MK108s, 103s, or MG151-20s, though ultimately none of the prototypes were armed. Considering that it had become obvious by this point that the B-29s were not really being used in Europe, it's somewhat surprising that the RLM sanctioned Blumenvoss to begin work on a new variant instead of tinkering with the V-2. But once they got the green light, the BV-155C was given an order for 30 aircraft once production had begun. The 155C would differ significantly, ditching the underwing radiators for a more traditional central annular radiator, more in line with other late war German interceptors such as the TAR 152. Meanwhile, the 155V2 had run into trouble elsewhere. The crash landing was well executed and ultimately didn't damage the airframe too much, but the attempted salvage operation, which involved wrapping chains around the aircraft and towing it out with a truck, ended up inflicting so much damage to the aircraft that it was deemed irreparable. The subsequent V3, developed alongside the ideas for the 155C series, was essentially like the V2, except that it was to be fitted with the DB603U the engine intended to power the 155C series, but it was ultimately only half finished by the time the end of the war rolled around, and its fate remains unknown. V1 and V2 were both captured by advancing British troops, and subsequently flight tested at the hands of the RAF back in England, V1 being flown until it was written off. V2, still damaged from its salvage attempt, was put into storage, where it still resides at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum today. It had become obvious long before the end of the war that the BV-155 was an answer to a problem that was almost three years out of date by the time it was approaching readiness of production. 
The entire concept had originally been a quick interceptor based on an existing design in late 1942. But somewhere along the way, with delay after delay, the RLM accepted a brand new design to begin work, which began as late as December 1943, which sort of undermines the entire point of the project. Ultimately, the BV-155 was a fascinating look into late war technology, sporting a bizarre, experimental design, but that would end up suffering the same fate as most German aircraft from 1944 and 45. Too little, too late. A huge thanks to my patrons on screen now for supporting the channel, and thank you so much for watching this video of Aviation Deep Dive. Consider liking and subscribing for more weekly content, and please also consider supporting us on Patreon. See you in the skies.